Well, welcome ornithology students to uh, Ornithology Lab for spring of 2020. Uh, these are unusual times, so unfortunately you're not going to be here for me to take you out. So I'm going to take you to the sites uh, that typically we would go to uh, if you were um, in lab. And I'm going to try to do videos of each one of those sites. So what I want to talk about right now is what the procedures expectations are for the class. Um, obviously, most of the class will be on Moodle. All the assignments will be on Moodle. All the quizzes will be on Moodles and test. And that includes both the lecture test, which there'll be three exams, and there'll be four uh, quizzes uh, that are quizzes that, are, that you would have if you were here uh, in lab. And you have to identify the birds by sight and sound. And we're going to do the best we can in making those available to you uh, on, on Moodle. Um, I'm going to look down my notes here for a minute, make sure I cover everything. Um, make sure that you visit uh, your email on a regular basis. Check your email because that would be one of the primary ways I communicate to you. Uh, also make sure that you check the, the Moodle site because all the assignments will be on there. Um, the videos will just give you kind of an introduction to uh, the bird species that you would find on each one of those sites. Plus, um, I'll talk about the habitat. As for example, uh, the first set of birds we're going to do today are birds you would normally find as resident birds in Ohio during the winter and early spring at the feeder. And so we'll talk about those birds first. And then on, your, on next week, we will talk about uh, birds you would see at Lake Logan. Uh, I'm going to try to do some video of the birds that we see uh, through the spotting scope and through the binoculars, but I um, don't know how well that's uh, going to work out, but we'll give it a try. Now, some of the things that you might need. Um, typically, when I do the first lab, I talk about field guides uh, and binoculars. Uh, those are the two things that uh, most likely you'll need, plus maybe a notebook to write notes in. Um, now, for a pair of binoculars, I'll be honest with you, uh, get the best pair that you can afford. Uh, the optics makes all the difference in any kind of binocular. So the more expensive binoculars have better optics, the cheaper ones have uh, less optics. But in either way, uh, the best uh, power to get is either 8x42 or 10x40. Uh, those are ideal binoculars for bird watching. Anything less than like 7x35 may not give you enough light to see the birds clearly. Anything over 42, let's say 50, gives you too much light. Unless it's a really cloudy, overcast day, you have too much light uh, for you to be able to see the birds clearly. Uh, so I would recommend uh, getting either a 10 by uh, 42, 8 by 42, 8 by 40, somewhere in, in that range. Uh, and practice with them. If you've never used binoculars before, you're not going to be necessarily looking at stationary ta targets. Uh, birds move, and so you have to be able to catch those birds as they're moving. So I would practice as much as possible out in the field uh, with your binoculars so you can become fairly uh, efficient with them. Um, now, bird guides. Most of my students in, in the past have used these two bird guides here, but these are times where the phone can be an extra source for for information about birds, but I'll share with you two bird guides, the Sibley Bird Guide uh, of Birds of Eastern North America and the Peterson Birds of Eastern North America and Central North America. Both these bird guides have been used um, and they are, they cover most of the birds that we'll be covering in this class, both by sight and by sound. Uh, they have pretty good illustrations in them uh, that point to the major uh, marks on the birds, especially by sight that you need to look for although I'll be covering that on the PowerPoint presentations as well. Um, now, you can also upload a, a free app called the Merlin app from Cornell University. Uh, the Merlin app, the one advantage of the Merlin app is not only do you have birds by sight, but you also have birds by sound. And since I'm not going to be there to help you identify a lot of the sounds you might hear if you're out in the field, uh, matching up the uh, sound that you hear on, on the app 
uh, with the bird that you're actually hearing may be uh, a good way to learn how to do those birds on your own. Uh, I know that's not ideal, and you know, my job was to teach you those songs uh, in the field, uh, but you're going to have to take a little bit more investment of time uh, to spend time in your field uh, on your own uh, learning birds. I did the same thing when I, uh, when I worked uh, for the Division of Wildlife. Many of the birds I learned, I learned on my own uh, as part of my career. So it's, it's an ongoing type of learning process. Um, those pretty much cover some of the major things that you need. Uh, you can get a notebook to make sure that you list all the birds that you see. This will be especially important for the assignment, the eBird assignment that I gave you already. Uh, you should have received an email on the eBird assignment with all the information that you need to do for that assignment. Um, it would be important to list your birds when you're out in the field so that you can take that information and then upload that data into the eBird site. Um, that will be very important because every bird that you upload there will have a point attached to it, so make sure that you do the assignment. It will be a major part of your grade, especially if we're here and doing this for the next eight weeks. Um, one other source, a uh, free source of information that's available to you uh, are the Division of Wildlife, the Ohio Division of Wildlife, ODNR, has some CDs that are available. Uh, and uh, again, use the CDs as sort of a secondary source after you've been in the field and I've given you a list of birds and I've given you some uh, songs that you need to learn. Use it as a refresher and then go out and listen to the birds in the field. The birds never sound the same in the field as they do on the CD or any other source for that matter. Um, so. But use them, they're free. There's one on owls, there's one on water birds, there's one on common birds of Ohio. Uh, they have these little pamphlets that go along with the CD, they're free. You just gotta contact the Division of Wildlife to, to, to receive them. Um, now, a lot of the offices aren't open, but I think you'll still be able to receive them through the mail uh, if you can't actually visit the office. Okay, uh, we're gonna include in this video uh, your first lab so to speak so i'm going to cover some of the birds that you would commonly see at a feeder and we may attach a little video of the feeder i have here at the house by the way this is i'm speaking from my home here in hawking county uh, and we ha i have a feeder out and we'll try to get some video of some of the birds visiting my feeder which will include a lot of what of the birds i'll be sharing with you here now these are not these are birds on a stick you might say Okay, so these aren't, <clears throat> I'm gonna go over the basic characteristics and marks on each one of these bird species so you can identify them live in the field. I'm gonna start with the seven species of woodpeckers. I had all seven species come to my feeder uh, this winter. Uh, these are birds that are resident species, birds that stay here year round. And so these are some of the first birds you will see before the migratory birds return um, later on this spring. So let me cover the woodpeckers first, and then I'll cover some of the uh, more common uh, resident species uh, that you might see, like chickadees and titmouse and so forth. The first two species, and I have this on the PowerPoint on Moodle, are very similar. Okay, so uh, one's called the downy woodpecker, which is the more commonly seen of the two. Uh, the other is the hairy. Okay, now, they're both black and white woodpeckers, all right, and uh, most of our woodpecker species are some combination of black and white, uh, and I'll talk more about the differences between the two. Uh, the one way to identify these, if you look at these, this white spotting on the, black, on, the, on the wings, plus this white patch on black, on the back is the way you tell both the downy and the hairy, okay, from any other woodpecker that we have in Ohio. They have white fronts, black backs. Uh, now these two are males. The males have this red uh, knot patch here on the back of the head, all right? The females do not. Females do not have, so they are sexually dimorphic in the sense that the, they, they are different in the males having the red and the females not having the red. Now, how do you tell the difference between these two woodpeckers? Well, size is one way to tell them, okay? 
if you don't have them together, sometimes it can be tough. So let's, let me give you another uh, characteristic of each one. Look at the bill length. The bill length on the downy woodpecker, all right, right here, is half the size of its head, okay? On the hairy woodpecker, it's the same length as its head. All right, so that's one way you can tell whether you have a hairy or a downy. Obviously, the size, or if you see them together, there's no doubt that you have a hairy and a downy and, and the difference between the two. The one thing I will say, the downy is more commonly seen because it'll occur not just in forest areas and forest habitats throughout the state, but it, it's more frequent at feeders. Uh, it's more frequent in urban areas and suburban areas. Uh, it's much more adaptable to a wide variety of habitat. Harry's, on the other hand, normally the places where you find them is mature forest. And if the feeders are close to a mature forest, then you may see them at a feeder. But they're not as commonly seen uh, around feeders and in uh, areas where there's a lot of human habitation, you might say. Okay, so those are two very common woodpeckers in Ohio that breed here and stay here all winter long. Probably the third most common woodpecker uh, in Ohio is a red belly woodpecker. The red belly can be identified fairly easy by a zebra back, this black and white uh, pattern on its back that sort of looks like a zebra is one way you could tell it. It does have a very light tinge of red on its belly. You can see it right there. But oftentimes in the field, you can't see that. And a lot of students have asked me, why is it called red belly? I don't see any red belly on it. But that's the extent of its red right there. Um, there's a very much of a tinge of red, which oftentimes you don't see. And it's on the male and the female both. Um, it's a fairly sizable woodpecker, a little bit larger than the hairy uh, woodpecker. Now, there is, <clears throat> they are sexually dimorphic, meaning the males are slightly different than the females. And again, it's the red. The red on the male extends from the base of the bill all the way back to the nape. Okay. The female will not have any red here, okay, just on the, the back of the head and the nape area. And that's really the only differences between the male and female uh, red belly woodpecker. The red belly is very, uh, very vocal. That's one of the most vo vocal woodpeckers that we have. And if you get on the, on to Moodle, and look at the PowerPoint, we have, I have an example of a song uh, on that, uh, and one I would expect you to know uh, is this one um, for a quiz or for a test. Uh, so make sure that you, you hear them both on, on, <clears throat> on Moodle as well as in the field. Uh, they're very vocal uh, in the field. Um, okay, so that's a red belly woodpecker. The next one we have is the flicker. Okay, the common flicker it used to be called the yellow shafted flicker, and you can tell why. It has this, these yellow veins and kind of goldish yellow veins on them, which are easily seen when they fly. Uh, it has kind of a yellow cast to them when they fly. Uh, another species, a cousin species of this particular species is the uh, red shafted flicker, which occurs in the western states, not here. So this is the only one you're going to see here. Um, unlike a lot of the other woodpeckers, it's not black and white. Uh, it's one of the few that have really very little black on it. It's got kind of this goldish brown tint on it with these black bars that go across. Uh, it has a white rump, which is really evident when it flies. Uh, it has spots on the breast, which is the only woodpecker species that we have that have these round spots on the breast. Um, it does have a little tinge of red on the back of his head. Um, the flicker, unlike a lot of woodpeckers, will perch. So sometimes you'll see these perched on a limb or the eave of a house uh, or on even on power lines. Uh, most woodpeckers uh, that I'll, I've talked about so far and we'll, I will talk about usually cling to a side of a tree. You normally would see a woodpecker, but flickers, they spend a lot of time perching and they spend a lot of time on the ground. Unlike a lot of woodpeckers, they spend time on the ground. Uh, they particularly like uh, ants. Uh, so they, they will get into an anthill, uh, not only for the ants themselves, but they actually use the ants or rub the ants in through their feathers, uh, a way of kind of cutting back on the feather mites. 
uh, sort of like a insecticide, you might say, that they use uh, to uh, glean the mites off their, off their feathers and off the skin. Uh, but they spend much more time on the ground than any other species. It also is very vocal, has an extremely loud voice to it, uh, which I'll talk more about uh, maybe in the field uh, when we're uh, at areas where the flicker would occur. Uh, but it's another song that I would expect you to know. Uh, it's kind of a flicker, 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 flicker call, which is where it gets its name, uh, the common flicker. Um, okay, so that covers, <clears throat> it's about the same size as a red-bellied woodpecker, pretty sizable. I can see the bill length here. It has what this is called a black gorget right here, right, which also is kind of unique for the woodpeckers. There's no mistake in a flicker when you see it. It's unlike any other woodpecker that we have in Ohio. Okay. Another black and white woodpecker that we have, and one of the prettiest woodpeckers that we have in Ohio, uh, is a red-headed woodpecker. Now, these are not sexually dimorphic, meaning the male and the female look identical. Uh, they both have red heads, they have black hats, black backs, excuse me, they have a white uh, rump patch with a black tail. They also have these white wing patches, okay, that are really evident when they fly, okay, and of course a white front. So it's a black and white woodpecker with a red head. Notice the difference, though, between this and, let's say, the red belly or the downy. They're, these are, this is plain black. There are no uh, white markings that are uh, mixed in with the black. It's is a plain black back. And of course the head, uh, just, it, unlike the downy and the hairy and the red belly, has a complete red head, okay? including all the way up into the neck and into the upper part of the breast. Okay? Now, one thing's interesting about the red-headed woodpecker is, <coughs> excuse me, it likes open woodland areas, especially with a lot of dead trees in it. Uh, it, it prefers to nest in dead snags, uh, vertical dead snags, uh, in open areas. Um, <coughs> one of the reasons why the population has declined, several reasons why, is because dead snags are not as available as they used to be with cavities in them. <coughs> and also, the starling is a competitor uh, with redhead woodpecker uh, for nesting sites. So. A combination of those two things is, is the species has declined considerably. It's not as common as what you would find these other woodpecker species are a lot more common in the red-headed woodpecker. Okay, <coughs> two more. The largest woodpecker we have in North America is the pileated. Okay, <coughs> the pileated woodpecker, again, just a little bit smaller than a crow, although it seems much larger when it's flying through the woods. Um, it's related to the ivory-billed woodpecker, which, as far as we know, has become extinct. Uh, the ivory-billed woodpecker did occur in Ohio along the Ohio River, uh, but as far as we know, it's extinct. Uh, very similar woodpeckers. Um, the size alone is one way to, to tell it. It also has this red crest, as opposed to the other woodpeckers that we saw. The red is actually a crest that occurs both in the males and the females. Okay. It has a white patch on the primary feathers that is really noticeable on the primary and secondary feathers when it flies. You can see it underneath as well, okay, when it, and when it flies. Um, uh, the pileated is a mature four species. It will come uh, to suet and to feeders. I've had them here at my house on occasion. I have a pair that I know it's likely is nesting here. We're close to the house, but it's a mature four species. You can also tell it uh, by its sound. It has a very loud uh, voice. It sounds like somebody laughing, you might say. It sounds like it's laughing at you. Uh, very similar to the flicker, but slightly different. Again, make sure that you get on to the uh, on Moodle, onto the PowerPoint, and you can compare the two uh, on the PowerPoint. Uh, to me, the flicker is a much faster song than what the pileate is. Pileate is much more a deliberate in how it presents its call, but it is very, very loud. Um, also, you, get, you know whether it's around because uh, the oval-shaped um, holes that it makes, uh, very large, of course, but they're oval-shaped as opposed to round, and that's a good indicator of a pileated woodpecker uh, being close by. Uh, the pileated, again, um, 
other, it does adapt to smaller woodland areas. Most likely you're going to find it in a mature forest. The last species we have is a little bit rare and doesn't really nest statewide. There's a few areas in the state of Ohio that it nests, but in the wintertime, uh, it's a good chance that you see it. It's not really a species that comes to suet uh, very often uh, or to feeders necessarily, but occasionally you will see it. Uh, this is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Uh, the yellow-bellied sapsucker, <clears throat> again, you're, you, you can usually see the evidence of it more than you actually might see the bird. The evidence of it is it, it will peck holes in a parallel line uh, in a tree and you have rows of it up and down. So it's very conspicuous if you see it and you know that a yellow belly wood sap, a sapsucker has been around. Okay, now they do, they do create these holes